I'm Lori Sinclair, the 2024 president of the Kitsap County Association of Realtors. Today, we're going to be chatting about the class that the KCAR just held on Tuesday with Annie Fitzsimmons moderating a panel of industry professionals. The class was at the intersection of NAR settlement, escrow closings, and residential real estate. And we are fortunate enough to have two of those panel members joining us today, Arlene Clayton from Pacific Northwest Title and Kevin Hancock of Evergreen Home Loans, as well as Sherry Nurmi from American Pacific Mortgage will be joining us. Jamie Haywood, the 2024 president-elect for KCAR, and our very dedicated Katie Revis, our member engagement coordinator for KCAR. So let's get started. So welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here today. So um, I guess I'll just go ahead and and ask what what were you guys' impression of uh, the session that we had on Tuesday? Do you want me to go? Sure, Kevin. I would love for you to go. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was good. Um, I actually had a lot of great conversations with folks that day. I've gotten a, a fair amount of positive feedback. Everybody seemed to think that it was a good uh, discussion, valuable. Um, people, you know, learned things that maybe they hadn't thought of. So overall, I thought it was uh, it was great. And I was very happy to be able to participate. Okay. Well, good. Thank you. Tell me, um, what... What do you think is going to change with, like, what do you see as reverberations um, from from the practice changes that we're having as a result of this settlement? I think that it's going to, as I stated before, I think that the amount of teamwork that is going to be required is going to have to increase. Um, it's going to be increased communication. It's going to be um, increased, you know, diligence on every property because there's going to be nuances on what's available on each listing. So I think it's going to create a little bit more work, but I think it's also going to be an opportunity for all of us to help demonstrate value to uh, buyers and to sellers. So I think it's um, it's going to be a little bit more challenging, but I think it'll end up being a positive. Okay, awesome. Um, I agree. I think that you know potentially there could be a little bit more work, I, especially in the explaining. You know, on from an agent perspective, um, there's going to be more questions and more explaining that's going to have to occur throughout the transaction. Um, I think. So I was wondering, are in the title community, are we seeing any changes so far? Are we seeing um, a lot of sellers not offering compensation and buyers having to come up with it? I mean, I know in my practice, I haven't really seen it, but you guys see a whole lot more um, out there in the world. We haven't seen very much of it. Um usually there's some compensation that's being paid by the seller, whether it's all that the buyer broker is asking for or not, at least, you know, there is some being paid. Um, Jamie, you were, I, we were just talking before we jumped on here. I wasn't at this particular class. I was at an earlier class and Jamie, you were at this particular class um, with these particular guests. Did, what were your takeaways um, from, from this? I think something that um, I think Kevin talked about that um, I hadn't thought about but makes a ton of sense is that if a buyer is paying um, their agent's commission, um, that that doesn't show on the loan estimate. <clears throat> so when they get that loan estimate and it shows how much money they got to bring to the table, it doesn't include that. Yeah. Um, but it sounded like you know a good loan officer is going to produce that total um, in a different way so that they don't forget that they owe that. Yeah. Um, but so making sure that we do communicate with our lender and make sure everyone's on the same page that 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 dollar figure is is reminded to the buyer and right. it doesn't get lost in the shuffle somewhere. So yeah. that that was interesting to me. That was probably the biggest takeaway I got from the lending stuff that I hadn't really thought about. Um, but I again, I'm not seeing much of a change. So how much of this are we really going to have to do? 
I mean, I'm sure there'll be some of it, but. Yeah. It, well, I think it just changes our conversations is really sure. what I think the biggest change is. It changes the conversations and it requires agents to really be able to articulate the work that is being done on the behalf of both a buyer and a seller and also be able to articulate to a seller the value of um, having a buyer have competent representation and that frequently competent <laughs> representation also means that they're going to be asking a seller to help contribute because that bucket of money that comes to the table is still the same bucket of money. It's not like buyers suddenly have a different bucket of money to bring to. Yeah. It's still the same bucket they've always had. And the same reasons that it created the need for sellers to offer buyer broker compensation, those same reasons still exist today. Like yeah. It hasn't changed. Yeah, it's it's really not. I don't see it as any different than negotiating closing costs. Exactly. It's, it's really just an additional closing cost. Yeah. That somebody has to cover. Yeah. It has to it's, land in somebody's law and somebody's column in the settlement <laughs> statement. Yeah. And it always has. Like it was never. Yeah. It, like it's not an additional that's now suddenly tacked on. It's just, right. it was always, always there. been there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was just the seller had always conceded in the past. Generally speaking, there were exceptions even and the before only, because it's always and been negotiable. And the only one bringing money to the table is the buyer. That's right. <laughs> it's the buyer's money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is what's interesting is that we've had this settlement of the seller's lawsuits, but there are buyers' lawsuits yeah, arguing that will the be, same yeah. points. So it can't be both, both right? What, yeah. Anyways, so it's going to be really interesting what falls out in those lawsuits that are still working their way through the system. Yeah, definitely. And I, I feel that, um, as Kevin was saying, it really is the communication piece of it just, and that's, what's nice about this also, you know, from that perspective is that it's an awareness for everybody, um, versus a mystery of where the money comes from. Um, everybody knows what part they're playing and, you know, it takes great communication through the process, um, on all parts to yeah. make a smooth transaction from start to finish. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, on the lending side. So from, from your perspective, like what has changed in your conversations with buyers, I guess, uh, currently? You know, we're just kind of figuring that out because it is a new conversation. Um, it, it's a little bit tricky because, as I said the other day, I don't ever want it to seem like I'm in a position where I'm negotiating agent compensation. Right. And it is a little bit of a tricky conversation to have because, you know, if I'm going to sit there and say, okay, you know, here's your potential closing costs. And, you know, if you have to pay your agent, here's a potential of, you know, what that could be. Um, most buyers I find these days are already, you know, not overly flush with assets unless they've recently sold a home. Um, but a lot of, you know, first time home buyers uh, are a little bit tight. So, you know, yeah. two to 3% of a purchase price is a big chunk of change. So yeah. um, I think that uh, it's important to try to educate them and make them aware that that's a cost that they could incur. But I'm also saying, you know, obviously it's still pretty much, uh, the standard in this market that sellers are paying the compensation. So most likely you won't have to deal with it, but it's still a possibility. So it's yeah. kind of weighing the, you know, wanting to be transparent up front versus not scaring people. Yeah. Um, Cause they're already, you know, a lot of times fairly cautious going into this process with all the um, negativity they've heard about rates and everything else. So um, it's, it's a change, but we're, we're adapting to it. Yeah. And hopefully the agents are having that conversation prior to the lender really getting in the thick of things. And, and then it's up to us to really share our buyer's agreement 
terms with the lender so that they are aware that, you know, this is the contract we have with this buyer. Yeah. So, you know, it just gets lumped in with all the other costs. Can they afford them? Do they have the cash? Do they not have the cash? Yeah. 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 And, and when I was talking to Annie about this, uh, you know, prior to the class, just doing the, the prep and studying stuff, you know, I asked her, should I be asking my agents for copies of that BBSA? And she said, no, she said, you don't need it, but you want to know what the, what the terms are in general. You don't need a copy of the form, but you do need to know what the buyers agreed to pay. So again, that's just communication. Is that going to come in the form of a, you know, phone call or a, an email, whatever the case may be, we do need to know what that number is. And then Really, the way that I think it's going to be most effective is when you're writing an offer, you're going to know specifically what's offered on that property so that then we can say, okay, you know, we're in a situation right now where, you know, this listing is not going to cover uh, the compensation for your broker. So let's make sure that we've got that covered. And I mean, I said this before too, but to me, it's all part of the acquisition cost. So if part of the reason that somebody likes a property is because it's $10,000 less than another house, but they're not paying any commission, well, it's not really $10,000 less because now you've got to come up with that up, out of pocket. So, you right. know, educating people and having those conversations as well. I don't know how often that's necessarily going to be the case, but it certainly could. Um, you know, the, the total acquisition cost has to be part of that buyer formulation. So if they are short on assets, that's, then that's not going to be the right property. Yeah. Are you finding, Kevin, when buyers are, you know, initiating that first contact with you, have, are you finding that they're already sort of aware of what's been going on or? I would say no, for the most part, Mo you know, most of the clients that I do uh, work with uh, do come from agent referrals, um, but I don't find that they're often coming in and saying, now we talked to our agent about this whole, you know, commission um, or compensation agreement and how is that going to affect us? They're not bringing it up to me. So um Again, I'm not exactly certain, according, and you guys know better than I do, but according to what Annie told me, that's supposed to be like the first conversation that you guys are having with new clients, but they, they're not asking me about it. So either they're being well-educated and they don't have questions about it, or they're not understanding it, or maybe those conversations just aren't quite in the flow of happening with every buyer yet. I, I'm not quite certain. Yeah. I think that this goes back to that whole, you know, <laughs> like you really have to be careful who you hire, right? Uh, and even though this has been prior to the settlement, this has been the law in Washington state since the start of year, January 1st. Right. Like we're supposed to be providing this information. I'm accustomed to, cause I'm licensed in another state as well. And, and the language we used was from the first substantive meeting is when you initiate this buyer agency conversation and you know everyone should be having that we have to provide it before we provide brokerage services that's the law um, and I think that a lot of people are still amazingly uncomfortable with that so if there's consumers watching you want to hire an <laughs> agent that's not afraid to have difficult conversations you want one that's going to be able to have that difficult conversation whatever that conversation may be, because there's going to be difficult conversations as you get through the transaction. And you don't want somebody that is, is too afraid to bring up something important. So right. that's part of the negotiation part too, knowing that somebody is going to cover all grounds for you. Absolutely. And yeah. Yeah. Part of it. yeah. Yeah. I find it really disconcerting. I think that um, that's probably one thing though, that is gonna the, the result of all of these changes um is going to be a little bit of the cream rises to the top right the people that are doing what they need to do are gonna flourish one thing that annie had brought up to me was the question of whether or not this is going to be addressed on pre-approval letters whether it would be a, a field that would be added or something like that so um i can report that um Internally for our company, we are adding a line on the pre-approval that basically a disclaimer stating that the pre-approval does not necessarily include any uh, commissions. So that if that's something that the buyer is expected to cover, we need to address that. So yeah. um, 
that is one. So you're not really coming. saying one way or another. Correct. And, the I mean, again, be, and, the unless, cash. if we were in a situation where the buyer's agent, you know, comes to me and has me write a specific letter for uh, a home and we know that it's not going to be covered, then I could change it or I could, you know, add a line in there that says, hey, it has been addressed and we already know we have the funds to cover it. It's basically more of a situation where if we issue a pre-approval letter and we don't know uh, exactly which property they're going to be making an offer on, which sometimes we do, you know, a generic letter. Like if somebody's going to look at houses on the weekend and they don't want to have to call me every time they decide they want to write an offer. Um, it's less common, but it does happen. So in that case, that little disclaimer would be on there. Um, okay. Interesting. You know, one thing that I've heard, uh, you know, a lot of agent chatter about is people are like, well, you know, I have Mr. Seller and and Mr. Seller doesn't want to pay. We'll use Annie's currency of chocolate truffles. Mr. Seller doesn't want to pay any chocolate truffles for the, the buyer's agent compensation. So because they're saying that, you know, there's so many cash buyers out there and a cash buyer would be able to afford compensation for their agent. And you know, my argument back to that and, and what I would probably say to Mr. Seller that doesn't want to pay chocolate truffles is, you know, that cash buyer still has X number of dollars available. That doesn't mean and and highly likely, just like every buyer, they're shopping the maximum amount that they can purchase with X number of dollars. And they're probably thinking that Mr. Seller's going to contribute some chocolate truffles to compensate their agent. And not just that, but whenever you're marketing a property, you want to widen the market to the most possible buyers. So why would you want to say, well, I'm only interested in looking at cash offers from buyers that can afford to compensate their agent the appropriate number of chocolate truffles. You might be able to get a better price from a buyer that is having some form of financing and does not have extra cash to pay any chocolate truffles or to pay all of the chocolate truffles to their to their agent. So you know, widening the market is always going to result in a better price. And it's really about the net price to Mr. Seller, not about who is bringing the chocolate truffles. Yeah, a lot sense. of cash buyers want a deal. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Well, and those cash buyers quite often are financing behind the scenes. Yeah. They just don't have that it, it's not showing up front. Like I've had cash buyers where they're like, I have a line of credit that's going to cover this whole purchase. I'm accessing that line of credit to pull the cash to buy the property. And then I will finance, you know, with a traditional mortgage after the fact. So it's not that they necessarily have the cash in the bank. It's just, they've got the credit ready credit that converts to cash. Right. So. Well, and there's definitely a perception in the marketplace, in my experience, that when you're paying cash, you get to pay less because, you know, you're you're bringing the cash to the table. So, you know, if the seller's goal is to get the most amount of proceeds, then trying to target cash buyers is not the best way to go about that. Exactly. It's all about that net price. Like we lose focus if we just focus on that top level. You got to focus on what filters through to the bottom you know, that net price. That's and where it's at. That's where having that financing um, option and having the communication with the agents as well as the lender going into it, then the if things are structured so that the seller actually nets more money, um, then having those conversations of what this financing brings and how it works mm -hmm. um, helps present that offer to in a light that shows the seller, you know, this is a stronger offer because you're going to be netting more. Yep. Yep. Agreed. So again, to any consumers watching, are you buyer <laughs> netters? <laughs> yeah. So well, I think that was a good conversation. I, I'm going to flash up that my meeting's about to end here soon anyways. Any final thoughts from you guys? No? Okay. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> well, with that, I want to thank all of you guys for joining us. And um, I look forward to seeing you guys another week on Coffee with the President. <laughs> <laughs>